Hi there, I'm Adam Kirwas and this is my novel, the video. One, Elena. Elena is in the office of Michael Buse. She looks around. This is a different world. This is not what she is used to. This is not what she would have ever expected her life to turn out to be. There are books on the walls. They look real. They look intimidating. Far from a distant world. And she got now a glimpse of it. She never thought that she would be one of them. One of these women. But here she is. She fidgets with her hands. With her fingers. How are you supposed to act? Take on a composer. Is it even worth worth an effort? Should she continue? Believe. Isn't it all about belief that you are always positive? Elena struggled always to show self-esteem, to assert herself. Since she can know, since she thought about it, she always struggled with being taken seriously. People left her when in school and she remembers this with bitterness even though it is years back, decades. She remembers it with bitterness in school. Mostly she was ignored. She could not bring out anything. She could not utter anything. People forgot her, oversaw her. She never ever talked about herself, could say the right thing, things people would expect, not even small talk. She's struggling to say the right thing. But now, now in this situation, now in her life, now she knows that she has to speak up. She has to get out of her. She has to save a life and then save hers. But how should she do it? She has never talked for herself. She has never challenged anything, questioned anything, has never disputed with anyone. It was never necessary. As if she could successfully arrange and array her life in that way that she did not need didn't need to quarrel, didn't need to go and circum, go straight into a matter, but rather is able to circumvent matters, find a way around it. As if she could successfully or has successfully lived a life even though she was always meek, even though she always struggled to assert herself, well, she succeeded all these years. But now, now, a calamity found her and she struggled, struggled to make sense of it. She's still struggling. She sees Michael Pius, the lawyer, this known lawyer, famous lawyer. He goes over the court documents. Elena is tearful. When she read those court documents, when she read the warrant, tears dropped down her cheek. She could not understand it. She could not understand why this all happened to her. Because she is a good-hearted person. And she has only good-hearted people around her. As if her good-heartedness, her softness, her benevolence, as if it would gleam and support and glow and shine into all the people she she has surrounded herself with, as if she could successfully make up for the lack of courage 
she is suffering from her good-heartedness that no matter where she goes no matter where she is that people even though immediately will realize that Elena is not one of these ordinary one would assume Latina all this prejudice this is about them as being strong and and determined proud and be able to speak up for themselves which Elena is all not but people would always assume her beautiful heart this is how Elena always imagined it so that they would treat her in accordance to her heart to this good natured woman because you do not hurt someone who is good natured you do not hurt a small kitten this is how Elena occasionally imagines herself this small untaught pacified non-violent kitten no one would hurt it no you would treat her well you would treat her nicely in that way this is how Elena hopes for and imagines she's been perceived by others and that people who surround her love kittens that they that, that they are like her that good-natured people would find each other and therefore she would never have to fear about anything in her life her life was 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 in its place she had everything she wanted but then things derailed how she could not make sense of it what happened she tries to focus she tries to find the strength because she's exhausted even sitting in this office breathing in the air this alone that she could make it in to the office that she could find the courage to go out and fight for something even this is already a big step for Elena but she has lost her ambition right at the moment when she walked in here this is a different world for her but she must keep it together she keeps reiterating it this is important sit here girl fight girl this is the fight and struggle for your life and she weeps she weeps because she cannot help herself you have to do something she pledges and begs the lawyer Michael Buse please you have to do something Michael Bu- Buse looks at her he wants to prevent that this woman makes a scene because he doesn't want to help her he cannot help her Michael Buse is a very smart lawyer he graduated from law school law school summa cum laude with highest degree Michael Buse was always considered a smart and ingenious person even in in his family there are a lot of smart people who had who maintained college degrees throughout or some of them even invented invented some stuff Michael Buse is very proud of his ancestors but Michael Buse and most of his ancestors they were they were not known for bravery and this is fine with him Michael Buse has never imagined life as a as a struggle f- for life and death this is only what you see in the movies in the TV real life is about asserting yourself is about awards about 
accomplishing something in a court. This is how you always imagined that gradually life is a process, a gradual process where you come on top. There is no struggle or whatsoever. There is no struggle for life and death. This is way more. This is way out of his league. And Michael Buse sometimes even has prejudice. This is against those people who always complain about a struggle for existence, for their lives, because he assumes that they are in the end responsible for it all by themselves. That they have a wicked and or non-conformative disposition. Because for Michael Bius, it is like law, like learning all those law, for all those law exams, like Alu getting knowledge there's only one way you can be successful in life and this is adaption this is all that is adaption and nothing else and everyone who com complains about life is probably one who is unable to adapt unable to work for anything in his life And now this woman stands here in front of him and it is a murder case. Even though it would be thrilling, I mean, every lawyer wants to have once or twice a very thrilling case, a case you mostly read in novels, in very, or in most suspense novels. But he is well aware what this case really means. It was all over the media. They reported back and forth Salvatore Garcia, a well-known criminal, a drug lord, has connections. He had connections to the Mexican cartel Salvatore Garcia, that's a name people feared on the streets. That's a name which conjured fear. But then this man was killed, just killed. How could it happen? A woman killed him. And everyone assumed that this woman had probably a good reason to kill this man. On social media, some even praised this woman as a hero, as a heroine. She did the right thing. Got rid of this scum. But law is a different thing. Even though this woman might have a lot of support on social media and there was But outside social media, in reality, things go differently. And Michael Buse, he knows well aware, at least he assumes, even though he does not know anything about the world of organized crime, but he can assume from all this rapper, from all this news and document terrorists and what people say and said about this case that this case is loaded this is tension and you don't want to deal with the with organized organized crime you don't want to deal with the cartel even though you are in america even though you, you are living free world and even though michael buse cannot imagine that anyone would even ever be able to reach him or hurt him because he lives in a gated community. He lives in a secure suburban place, in a secure suburban home. So the world outside the world is far away from him. Even though he feels very secure, but he has heard and read and seen some horrific stuff about the Mexican cartel. 
And the last thing he wants to be is get involved in this. No, he wants to have a normal life with his wife Barbara. And he, he wants his life to be in his control so that he never loses the overview. And this, this case, he again reiterates the, the name Salvan Torre Garcia in his mind, even the name alone puts one under pressure, induces fear. No, he doesn't want to deal with this, but yet he doesn't want to lose his inter integrity. He doesn't want to be seen as a coward who doesn't want to take on a criminal, a criminal who is obviously who was obviously very hated and people cheered his death and he would have liked to be a hero for all these people. He thought about it for a while. He fancied with the thought how would he be perceived by all these people, by the media, the lawyer who defends this poor soul, the lawyer who does the right thing. Wouldn't it have been great for him to see himself as a hero in the eyes of the media and in the eyes of the people? People would probably have cheered him, approved him, sent their support. But then he thought about the other side, the black side, the dark side, the shadows of this issue. What if he has to deal with it? Deal with the cartel? deal with organized crime because even though people support him even though people help him and will send all his all approvals but in the end they are only on social media they are only by lip when the cartel comes knocking he stands all by himself and this scares him. This scares Michael Buse. No, he would have loved to be a hero. He would have loved to be a hero for this woman to be admired by her, by many attract, attractive women, because Michael Buse assumes that there are a lot of women outside who are suffering from the hands of the cartel or from the hands of violent men, violent Mexican man. And he as the hero would have been the one who would have been able to save all these women, give them meaning, bring them back, bring them back to liberty, help them to emancipate even though Michael Buse, he was never a feminist and he did, did never care about feminism and he most of the time in college had nothing but contempt for feminists, especially his fellow law students, these women who assumed that law should help to fight for the weak and that a lawyer, a good lawyer would always fight for the weak and do his best to improve the life of those who are in need. But for Michael Buse, this was rather ridiculous. A lawyer, first of all, you do the right thing, even though it was never really clear for Michael Buse, what is the right thing, what you do, what's, what's what you are supposed to do. Yet, fighting, fighting at always two sides of an issue. The one side is that you have to maintain yourself so you can't fight on a hungry stomach. You can't fight when you are hungry, can you? And the second thing is that you, are, that you use the courtroom in a way, in that sense, that you are being known. It is always about you. It is always about the lawyer. It is always about the, the person who stands in the middle of it all. No matter what people say, law and being a lawyer is always about a 
appearances. It is always about how you appear in court, how you are being perceived. Especially in America, where there are a lot of cameras in courts, you always try to maintain a appearance. You do not fight just for good. Who thinks that way? This is ridiculous for Michael Bills. He looks again at Elena. He wants to be cautious, try, wants to find the right words. Elena, she perceives that this is probably a dead end. Again, she's lost. Again, she's about to drown. Drown like the day the police came knocking. Her world was in a bliss. She felt good about her life. She felt positive about the future. Her small little world and then it was turned upside down when the police came knocking. They had a warrant of arrest for her, for her daughter Anna Dialupe. When Elena read this, she fell out of the clouds. She could not believe it. How could this happen? Her daughter, this daughter who is like herself, a small, peaceful, pacified, nice kitten. How such a person could have ever killed anyone? And there she could read. Her daughter had killed Salvatore Garcia. Why? 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 Why did she kill anyone? She, Elena did not ask her daughter and herself why did she kill Salvatore Garcia. No, she asked herself why did she kill it? How could she find the strength to hurt someone? How? Could she? Later, Elena found out that her daughter, Anna Dia, took a knife and she stabbed, stabbed Salva Torre Garcia many, many times, as if she was mad, as if she was raving mad, as if something dire had happened. Elena read the warrant over many, many times. Her mind, her eyes could not settle on the writing. She couldn't grasp it. She couldn't f see through it. Her daughter, she was always the cherry of her eye. Her daughter was everything she was not. Her daughter is very smart. She was always known as smart. And she was the future of her. She was supposed to go to college, the first in her family. And how proud she was about Anna Dia. She lived through Anna Dia. Her life, she occasionally imagined how her life would have been when she would have been in Anna Dia's place. And then all came crumbling down. Elena stood there for a while, saw how the police handcuffed her. She would have never been able in the past even associate police handcuffs with her daughter, that her daughter has been carried away and she saw her daughter right in the eye. She wanted to believe that everything is not right, that everything is not supposed to, to be that way, that there must have been some mistake because mistakes, they happen. People are wrongly accused, but she saw in the, in the face of her daughter a wickedness.
like cold heartedness. She saw as if her daughter would not even deny what she did. She hoped for that her daughter would yell and would make a big fuss. This is all a miss. Take. I'm not the one you are looking for. No, I have not killed anyone. But Elena's daughter, Anna, dear, she was silent. She was silent in a wicked way. She was silent that caught Elena off guard. She was silent as someone is silent who would be able to even hurt a kitten, to even hurt a puppy. This was a face Elena never saw in Anna dear. And this left it her stranded. For a while she could not get up. She sat down the warrant in her hand. This piece of document knew more about her daughter than she did. She didn't know anything. And in the beginning, she accused herself of it, that her daughter probably swayed from the right path and that she is responsible for it, that she has to be a responsible responsibility for it, her weakness, that she could not care for, him, for herself, that she could not get out of this body, that she could not assume a stronger personality, that she is so caught and weak, and that she wasn't able to give her daughter guidance, she and she alone now has to struggle with it. It was hard to breathe, it was hard to get up, it was hard to find herself. And Elena, back then alone in this home, in her world, which was before that, paradise where she thought that she had lived a good life, that she was living a good life and that everything was fine. After it was turned upside down, she almost would have given up, but then she found the courage and this is a lot for her. She found the courage to get up. She could not believe it. She swept aside swept aside this cold-hearted, mean and in, indifferent facial expression of her daughter while she was taken into custody. No, she didn't, she didn't want to believe it. There has to be an explanation. Anna Dia was and is her daughter. She did not fool herself. She did not live anything else. Then, in reality, for Elena, it, this was clear. Now she has to fight for her daughter. She has to fight for her life. She got up. She looked in, around in her home. She, she was alone. She, was for, she felt for the first time alone in her life. She was always in company since she could think of. She, she started out. She, uh, she had never lived alone in her life before. But now, now, but then she was struck, struck with it. And now Elena thinks about her, the, the big change in her life in the office of Michael Beuys. She, she thinks of her, about it in a great deal. How far she has developed, how far she came. This struggle for the life of her daughter, this fight for the future of her daughter made her probably a different person. Even though she could find the strength, the power and energy yet she is always on the verge of losing it, on the verge of losing her composure, as if you just act on it, as if you just play the role of a strong personality, of a strong character, and that 
eventually it will fade away fade away right at the moment when your strong personality the the person the identity you've assumed it struck or can or comes on a barrier in reality then all dissolves elena doesn't have stamina she hasn't lived the life of a strong woman she hasn't lived a, a, the life of a confident strong woman and in the dependent strong woman elena was always emotionally dependent on others and she is now she knows that michael bius will reject her like all these others no one wants to take on the case a public defender even they and in her about it even they rather try to avoid this case no one wants to g- get involved with the cartel she's fought for this is a bitterness and again she feels that she cannot get out of her body out of this meek body her, her composure her mind has not chiseled has not formed a strong confident body rather it has trapped her trapped her in a belief that she will never ever prevail that she's meek that she's weak and and without others she she cannot do anything she imagines her daughter anna dear she's a strong woman she's a very confident woman she's a woman who can fight some days elena even thought that anna dear she's not her daughter at all she's the complete opposite of her she's not like her and things would have been different elena is sure when anna dia would have been in her place when she would have been there she would have known how to fight how to get her out of prison but elena again loses courage it is like a liquid or something you have but it is so drained so fast courage is not something she can keep herself strength she, this is these are not things that actually puts she can keep in her mind now that she's been drained and deprived from them and she always has to have to recharge and she imagines herself in her mind that she always needs to remind herself that she can do this that she can accomplish this that this will eventually do not end badly because after all who would not love kittens who would be so cold hearted to hurt a, a kitten or even a small puppy who is that person to ernesto ernesto cleans the cows bob dwell he has been cleaning the car for a while now bob doyle is the boss of the leasing company and as to works for now he is in an interim he is waiting for another job offer bob doyle has promised him something would come up and while something come up he should make himself useful and busy clean around his home his car and as to sit in his car a great um, american car chevrolet and he imagines what it would be like when he would drive the car when he would drive along the street when he could be himself when he can live a day without every without everyone calling him frankly when people would look at him and say yeah well that's that's ernesto guspe 
I know him. He, he's not anyone. And then Esther imagines what it would be like to have a home, to have a live, to live in peace in the U.S., to have something you can look forward to after your working day and not having to fear that your home could be invaded by immigration and custom officers because Ernesto was an, is an undocumented, undocumented migrant. He is illegal. The word illegal bothers him. However, it's a fact. He entered the U.S. illegally. His parents entered the U.S. illegally. He struggled all his life from one place to another. Another. You always had to be on a move. And the worst thing is you cannot partake in the normal life of all others. This is like a secret or an open border. Border within the society. Not between Mexico and the US. No, it is within the society. A wall which bars one from the life of all those others, of all those other Americans. He is excluded from. He has never socialized with them. And the, the worst thing was that you had to work. And Esther had to work his youth through. He always imagined that he could have never been able, or he was never able to have a childhood, to have a childhood like all, the, all those others, other youths, that he had not the time to grow up properly. No, she, no, he had to work very early on. He had to work his ass off. He had to do odd jobs, and he has been doing odd jobs for all over, for all long, and always looking out in fear. He could be deported. And this fear grappled him, grappled him many, many times. There was even moments when he said to himself, God damn, this is not worth living for. God damn, why don't I go back there? Why don't I, why, why don't I go back to Mexico? Try to live there somewhere. At least I could live freely. At least I could live without fear. This constant fear, this constant feeling to be on the run, this was unbearable. Everywhere he would go, the home he would assume, the places he would live, it would never be anything that would ever belong to him. He has never, to this very day, has never even chosen furniture. He has never furnished his home. He has never even bought a carpet, a rug or whatever for his home. It was n never meant to be. It was useless because you would never stay long. Because he always had to move from one place to another. So in all those homes, in all those places he lived, those homes had never any personal notes or any personal effects of him. He always lived from suit case to suit case. His suit case was his dresser. He, he never he even dares to unpack his suit case. No, because it could be more than possible that he has to move in the middle of the night when he, when he reads about immigration and custom officers making controls they are very sophisticated and Ernesto is part of a WhatsApp group which warns each other. It is a good group and it has saved him a couple of times. And even though whenever 
Ernesto could escape and he was joyous and blissful. Then after he always asked himself, yeah, what, what for? Now I have to go back in my life, go back in this prison. Assume this life over and over again. For what purpose? It was exhausting. It was mortifying because he could not live a normal life. While all others, while all others, while all other Americans, they did not even bother and think about it. They probably had never think about the struggle an illegal migrant has. They never had to think about it. It never crossed their mind. And how his life would have been. How he would have been. What a person he would have been without this fear. Constant fear. Fear consumes him. Fear devours him. He doesn't dare to speak up. He doesn't dare to raise his voice. Fear has become his main character trait. The reason for his feeble voice. The reason for his hunched back. The reason for his cautious steps. Fear is predominant. But then things changed. Things changed for the better, but for NS3 it is only slightly better. Things have only become slightly better with Pablo Alhambra. And that he could assume the identity of someone else. Frankie. This is the reason why everyone calls him Frankie. And the scheme works as follows. Illegal migrants, in order to be able to work and in order to be not deported when police stops them, assume the identity of someone else. Someone who is legally in the US. This they need, of course, help. And thankfully, in the US, it is easier to assume it, to get that. So, so these people who assume the identity of someone else, then of course have to pay fees for them. They go to work for these other peoples whose identity they have assumed. They pay taxes in the names of the persons whose identity they have assumed. And they have an ID card of the person whose identity they have assumed and they look a lot alike. So that they can maintain an ordinary, a normal life. At least this is what they've been told. Pablo Alhambra, the guy, the guy Ernesto met for the first time. He was recommended by someone else. Ernesto remembers his smarmy clip smile. He got him this smile which Reveals, well, you don't have any alternative. You came to me because you cannot go anywhere else because I have you in my hands. He knew it. And Pablo Alhambra explained him this scheme. It is all legal, he said. You don't have to fear about your life anymore. You get an ID and you are thankful for the for the opportunity and you are thankful to the person who gives you the chance to have a normal life as an illegal migrant. He gives you willingly his identity, his ID, but you have to pay him some fees. It sounded all simple. It sounded all as if it would be a relief from all the 
Bert, no more fear anymore. And what if it? He could walk past the customs officer. He could pass the walk past the police. He could even show some IDs, and everything would be fine. He would not have to fear that he is being deported anymore. And because Ernesto is white, from Hispanic and the Mexican, he has Spanish blood flowing through in his vein. And he goes through as white man. He got an identity of someone who was called Franklin Patton. Frankie. The first time Ernesto held this ID, he looked at it with pleasure. This was the card. This small card was the relief. This small card decided whether he would be deported or not, is, is determining, is determined whether he can live a normal life or not. It, if, it means the world, the world of two worlds, the difference of two worlds. But then he, he grew thoughtful. It is not his name after all. It is not him. Franklin Patton. And as to thought about it, where this Franklin Patton lives, where he is, how does he look like? Pablo Alhambra said that you look like him. And everyone who will see you will miss take you for him. And he even warned. And as to that if you meet someone who recognizes you, who calls you Frankie, watch out. Say that you are in a hurry. Say that you have to be somewhere. Be polite. And if you see someone willing to talk with you, fake a phone call. Fake anything, but you have to get out of here. You don't want to raise suspicion. That's all Pablo said to him. Ernesto would have needed more information how this Franklin Patton is, how he's act like. He could be Franklin Patton, he could act like it. He, there were days when Ernesto even thought he, he could trick everyone to be Franklin Patton, as long as he has enough information about him. These were word thoughts, word thoughts. But again, in the end, he always looked at the card of the ID card. His name was not on it. The name his parents gave him, the name he was baptized with, but he could live on. And then he applied for a job, Bob Doyle, of course Bob Doyle, Knew, knows about this scheme. Of course he and all these others, they take advantage of illegal migrants. And when he applied for the job, and as to remembers, he came in, shake hands. Bob Doyle had the application papers in his hands. He smiled when he looked at Ernesto. And he said, Mr. Patton, he said it in a sarcastic way. This is your name, isn't it? He continued with a smirk. And as though he could only nod. This is all what you can do. He was in his hand. There is nothing. This was the first time he would try out whether it works or not. Whether he could assume the identity of someone else, or whether he can be finally free of this fear, free of this all-consuming fear. Bob Doyle asked for his ID. Well, 
he said again with a smirk, there are a lot of people who come in here with fake IDs. I just want to make sure that you are not one of them, fella. You see, again, Ernesto nodded. He gave him his ID, Franklin Patton. Bob Doyle looked at the ID in his hand for a while. And as this photo was on it, he turned it upside down, scrutinized it. Bob Doyle probably assumed that it was all fake. And then he exclaimed, you people are good, you know, you people are really good. He was thoughtful for a moment and then give, gave back his ID to Ernesto. Well, we are hard working folks here. You see, this is in America. So he left all the pretense and as to thought that he would go, that the job interview would go according to him being an American, that he would be treated for the first time as an American Franklin Patton wasn't it an American name. But he was disappointed. Bob Doyle, he knew right away who he was, what he's been doing about this scheme. Pablo Alhambra had recommended that he should apply for a job, for a legal job, but not everywhere. There are some who are too suspicious, or some who, f who wanna make a bargain, or try to get a bounty in reporting illegal undocumented migrants. So you have to be careful. Some are just wild. However, Ernesto had prepared himself for a, for a job interview, what a normal American man would say, or a young man would say, go into a job interview. He thought that he will probably will be talking about his school. He, he prepared some, some phrases. Well, school was tough, yeah, but I made it. Yeah, I, I did not get along with all teachers, but well, so what, no one can. He got some grades and diplomas from Franklin Patton, nothing significant, but enough to apply for a job. So enough that he could say, well, here, Franklin Patton, he graduated from high school. Here it is. And his name and everything is, seems legal, isn't it? And he prepared all this school. He made even research about this high school Franklin Patton went to. He was curious what guy Franklin Patton was. Was he the teacher's pet? Was he the cool guy? Was he the was he an athlete or whatever? He asked even Pablo Alhambra. But Pablo only shakes it off. Don't you worry, Bob. He will take care of you. That's all he got. The life of someone else. He assumed that he doesn't know anything of it. But yet he, he prepared for the job interview. Diligently, He wanted to be perceived as an American. He wanted to perceive this, to be this Franklin Patton. But then Bob had nothing but contempt for him. He could feel that this man probably does not like Latinos. That he, that he is not fond of him, fond of them, but yet he is willing to to take one of them in. We are hardworking folks here, you know. This is what America is.
Bob Doyle went into a lengthy speech why America is more advanced than all those Latin American countries. Because we do not leave things to chance, he told. In the end, Ernesto, we work for our life. We are decent folks. We do not betray. We do not cheat. And here and there, Bob Doyle stopped, looked again at the name of the application paper at the header, Franklin Patton. You see, Mr. Patton, he again said this, said this surname with sarcasm. You see, Mr. Patton, this is what is America. And many, they do not understand what's like to be American. We see, we see as if he had thought about something, as if he had maybe or may have not given up that, may, that, that Ernesto, this Franklin, could probably become an American. Who knows? But that was it. That was Ernesto. Ernesto, who gave up his name who was not called Ernesto anymore, but Frankie. Bob, the guy who said his name, his surname, sarcastically, his assumed surname, with a smirk, had grown accustomed to calling Frankie as if there would not be any barrier whatsoever, as if he would have been Frankie all his life. Frankie, Frankie, Frankie. He heard this his entire life, even on the, even if he works with other people, with other illegal migrants, at least he assumes that they are undocumented like himself because they do not know each other. They do not talk between each other. Some of them assume that the guys with whom they work with, that they are all Americans. And if they reveal, if they reveal that they are not legally here, that someone would immediately run to the custom office, want to get a bounty or whatever, and report someone undocumented migrant. So it is safer to assume and even continue to, to play the role, even for the sake of learning to practice the language. So even in his job and when you meet other people, Ernesto is called Frankie, is assumed to be a true American is it is assumed to have no worries whatsoever to be an ordinary all American boy the guy from the neighborhood who swipes your driveway who helps you in the garden who mows your lawn who helps you with your fences and so on, who does all these odd jobs for you, so you do not have to fear anything, it's not a foreigner, it's not anyone, look at him, he looks white, he looks like a white American, and his name is Franklin Patton, Frankie, so you don't have to worry about anything. The thought makes Ernesto sad. It feels like at it, as if he would be changing, as if something inside him would be transforming. And there are a lot of days where he can't just hear the stupid name Frankie anymore. But what can he do? He has no alternative. <laughs>